I said it in December, and I'll say it now. The Florida Gators should pursue Seydu Traore in the transfer portal again. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Lockdown Gators, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. Happy Tuesday. I'm Brandon Olson. Find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Written work with Whole Nine Sports, Giants Country, NFL 33. And we're talking about not receiver, not running back, but a different kind of pass catcher in Seydu Traore beast like i said he hit the portal in december from arkansas state i said florida should pursue him they did not attempt to (laughs) in december then he went to colorado which was a cluster you know what um and then he hit the portal at the start at the end of the second window after spring ball like many colorado buffaloes did and like you know four now uh, players that joined Colorado in January and left with the end of the April window because, well, it kind of sucks there because you have Deion Sanders, who is, oof. But, um, yeah, I, I spoke about Seydu Traore in the first tra- transport window. Florida ended up not pursuing him. I understand that tight end is not this huge need on the team right now. I understand that you've got plenty of young tight ends that are very good or at least will be very good. And you've got some veteran presence in there. But similar to how we're going to talk about Seydu, it's kind of how we spoke about Alton McCaskill yesterday where we were like, hey, you know, add good players when you can. And that's the thing that we're trying to do. I, I don't care if it's at a position where you're like, ah, we don't really need someone there. Well, we have scholarship spots available, and you can add good players when they're available. So you do that. Like I said, he went to Colorado. He entered the second transfer portal window. My understanding of the situation is Seydu Traore went to Colorado, did not like the coaching staff did not like how the coaching staff treated him or other players. And so he left. That is again, my understanding of the situation. So please do not let Colorado fans or people who cover or people who cover Colorado, please. And by Colorado fans, because we know they all of a sudden became Colorado fans. Um, don't let them talk you into the idea that Traore lost the starting tight end spot. Don't let them do that. I know how every time a player leaves a school, it becomes, well, he wasn't going to start here anyway. That is not the case with Seydu Traore. Okay, he, he was all sunbelt last year. He was, I think, third in catches and yards amongst all college football tight ends. He didn't lose the job to a tight end room that features three other scholarship players that combined for eight catches last year. Okay. They will not convince me. Do not let them convince you that say Traore was losing any kind of competition in Colorado. Okay. Cool beans. Just wanted to get that one out the way. Cause I know Florida Gators fans, some of us did it with, or some Florida Gators fans did it with Xavier Henderson. When he hit the portal, it wasn't true. It wasn't just know that. Sorry. That was the worst ASMR that you're ever going to get in your life. Um, but when you just look at the tight end room, it's like, you've got Keon zipper. Who's supposed to be your primary pass catching tight end. Keon zipper out for the year. Unfortunate. Dante Sanders dealt with injuries throughout all spring, could creep up again. Jonathan Odom dealt with injuries from the end from the bowl game last year, could impact his season at the start this year. So you throw Seydu Traore in there, and now you've got a rotation where Dante Sanders, when he's healthy, 
Jonathan Odom when he's healthy. Uh, Hayden Hansen, Arliss Boardingham, Seydou Traore. Those are your five. Like I, I think that the plan for Florida this year is to rotate more tight ends. I spoke about it yesterday with running backs where I was like, you know, I think this coaching staff wanted to rotate more running backs, but they clearly didn't trust Lorenzo Lingard or Naquan Wright last year. I feel like you can kind of do that with tight end, except it wasn't as much we don't trust the other tight ends. I feel like it was more like, hey, they're not ready. Like our list came in, dealt with injuries, and then at the end of the season, he got a little bit of run. You had Hayden, true freshman, quarterback turned tight end. You had uh, just walk-ons after that. You had, I think I think it was nine players, nine tight ends last year, but like Nick Elsness was one of them. He transferred out after not getting playing time. Griffin McDowell was one of them, but he was also an O-line turn D-line turn tight end. And it just it wasn't a great position last year, for being honest. Jonathan Odom dealing with injuries definitely didn't help. Arliss Boardingham, like I mentioned, dealt with injuries, and that didn't help either. I think that this coaching staff does want to rotate tight ends. I think that this year you'll see them do it more with a little bit more, we'll say, comfort in the uh in just the position in general because really last year there wasn't much so i think that you see more rotating which means you're going to need at least four or five viable players that you can throw in there at any time since you want to have two on the field at any given time i think that you might see a little more we saw 12 personnel was one running back two tight ends last year i think that you'll see a little more 21 personnel this year maybe where it's your two running backs and one tight end and two receivers hey you might see 22 person. Now, can you imagine being a defense and lining up with Graham Mertz in the shotgun? To his left is Montreal. To his right is Trevor Etienne. Tight end on the right, Dante Sanders. Tight end on the left, Arliss Boardingham. Or, or actually, even we'll go uh, Hayden Hansen there. And it's just like your two big blockers. <laughs> so you, you've got a running threat on each side, a blocking tight end on each side. And it's just like this, this wing T type situation. And it would just be nuts. Um, I'm kind of hoping it is. I, I, I know someone from the staff watches this show. Do that. Okay. Do that. Thanks. But we're about to talk about Seydou Traore and what he would specifically bring to the table here. But first, Today's episode of Lockdown Gators is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook. New customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. I'm pulling up my phone right now so that I can talk through what happened in uh, Sunday night's Suns versus Nuggets because the bets that I had cash, that game was free money. Like They were handing it out. Michael Porter Jr. over eight and a half rebounds. Devin Booker, 35 points. He had 36. Kevin Durant, 35 points. He had 36. Uh, Jokic, over eight and a half assists. Jokic, 10 assists. I also parlayed Booker, 35 points. Kevin Durant, 35 points. And Jokic, 10 assists. The odds were plus 1632 on that bad boy. It was a great night. Marcus Smart, Marcus Smart also I laddered 16 and a half points assists to 19 and a half points assists. He hit them both. I'm just saying, money making machine. Money making machine in the NBA playoffs. That's my point. Go to fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Thanks again for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. Please do make sure to like, subscribe, comment, review. We're about a thousand away from uh, 5,000 subscribers, which is where I'm trying to get by the start of the season. So we got time. We got time. But you could help. Just note that. But talking about Say Do Traore. Thanks, dog. Just barked in the background. <laughs> I don't know if you heard it, but I did. Uh, but say do Traore, I love his skill set. There's a big reason I, I was pushing for him when it was him hitting the portal from Arkansas State. And it was like, hey, I want to go power five. I want to be productive at the next level. I want to show what I can do. And then I want to go to the NFL. He wants to be a one more year guy and then go. 2021 was his freshman year. Didn't play a ton. 2022 is his sophomore year all sunbelt 2023 is to say what he can do but he is more of a move tight end he is legitimately a wide receiver that turned into a tight end so he's a wide receiver tight end hybrid but he's also a weird version of that and i don't mean weird in a bad way i mean weird version as in say do 
is a wide receiver turned tight end, but he worked for the huge majority of his snaps last year. He worked attached to the line of scrimmage as an inline tight end. Like th- that's that's what I'm talking about. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up his numbers now just because I I think it's insane. Um, but we are going to pull it up because Sadu Traore is someone that I want, and he I think it's probably important to talk about that. But his snaps by position, according to PFF, one snap in the backfield as a fullback. Uh, he had 90 snaps in the slot, 20 snaps out wide, 489 snaps in line. Okay. As far as his route running goes, he ran a total of uh, 17.4% of his snaps from the slot, or percent of his routes from the slot, 4% of his routes from out wide, 78.6% of his routes from being in line. So yeah, he, he's got experience everywhere. Obviously, he's most comfortable in line, but he's plenty big, and he runs routes like a former wide receiver. Like he, he obviously he doesn't have the wiggle of someone that plays wide receiver now, but because he's bulked up mostly, but he runs routes like someone who used to play wide receiver. Like the, the simple, the nuances he has in some of his breaks, you watch and you're like, oh, okay, like you know what you're doing, and that's an important part here, especially for a team that lacked so much production from the receiver room, or honestly just lacked production overall from any specific receiver last year. And that's not a knock on anybody. That's just the truth of what Florida's passing game was last year was not really anybody taking over at any point. Like last year, Seydoux Traore had a total of 49 catches, 628 yards, and four touchdowns. That would have been the most catches on the Florida Gators by 13 catches. That would have been... Uh, 669 yards was the leader. He had 628, so he would have had the second most yards on the team, and he would have had the second most touchdowns on the Florida Gators last year. That's including receivers. Like, he was more productive than every pass catcher on the team but Ricky Pearsall, and even then he had more catches than Ricky Pearsall. It's just a matter of the yards after the or the yards per catch there that wasn't as good as Ricky Pearsall. So... Seydu Traore can run routes and produce like a wide receiver, okay? And that's a big plus to your just pass-catching group, especially with Graham Mertz at quarterback who wants to throw the ball to tight ends, right? Hmm? Something he does. But throughout his career, Seydu Traore has also made a a just killing by winning contested catches and being a jump ball threat. Uh, You can watch Ohio State. It was James Blackman. Yes, that James Blackman threw the ball to Seydou Traore on an outbreaking route to the right uh, like sideline. And the defender is in the way. And Seydou Traore has completely blocked and just reaches around the defender and and reels in the catch like that. And it was just like the concentration there and the hand skill, the hand talent to be able to catch that or even get your hands on it and reel it in. Incredible. Like Seydou Traore is a beast of a pass catcher. That's why you should add him. Just one drop in 2022. And last year, there were three games that Seydou Traore played in where when he was targeted, James Blackman had a 158.3 passer rating, which is a perfect passer rating. Seydou Traore is like a safety blanket quarterback's best friend, right? So add him to your team, maybe, Florida. Also, as far as blocking goes, because obviously he's a tight end, this is going to be a run-heavy offense. He shows good effort in blocking, good engagement in blocking. Like He doesn't look lazy with it at all. It is a little harder to evaluate Sadie Traore's blocking from a receiver like Montana Limonius Craig, for example, or Keon Coleman, where you're watching a guy who's doing a pretty solid job of blocking edge defenders and linebackers and safeties at Arkansas State, which I'm not the type to disrespect the Sun Belt. I don't do that. I I went to a group of five school. I'm all in on group of five guys can be just as good as SEC guys. What I am saying is that pretty consistently, Seydou Traore went against not NFL talent and did well, 
Bo Binnigan is not NFL talent. And when you go to the SEC, you're going to be playing NFL talent. So it's the same question that was there with Osiris Torrance, where no one doubts Osiris Torrance. But when he was coming from uh, Louisiana to Florida, it was, well, how will that translate? That's the same thing here with Seydoux Triore. And like you can watch the Ohio State game, which is where Seydoux, I forgot if I said it, but that's where Seydoux Triore made that insane catch on the back of a defender. You can watch that and see that and kind of see how he held up. But, you know, over a sing- over a season, it's way more important to evaluate over a singular game against Ohio State. As far as how he fits in the offense specifically, I think that one of the biggest things Sadie Triari would bring to the table as a Florida Gator, if he's a Florida Gator, would be the amount of, I hate saying dynamic duos, um, that you could put on the field, but I do mean dynamic duos in the sense that they'd be dynamic, not as in like they're the dynamic duo, like they're not Batman and Robin. Um, but you can get really creative and really fun with what you could do with the tight end room if you have, say, Dutriore on your team. Like, for example, if you want to get really fun with your passing game, say, Dutriore, Arliss Boardingham. And then you have two wide receiver tight end hybrids. One of them is already very comfortable operating in line. One of them can move around the formation. And you just wreak havoc with that. Like, imagine that formation I talked about before with the two running backs and the two tight ends. Imagine if that's Seydoux Traore and Arliss Boardingham, where you're like, yeah, they're not as good run blockers, but they're even bigger pass-catching threats here. Right? Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun to be like, yeah, we can come out in 22 personnel and throw the ball on your head like that. Ricky Pearsall at receiver with those, those tight ends, uh, Sadie Trevor, all this boarding him, Montreal Johnson, Trevor Etienne. Like, defensive coordinators might have an aneurysm just trying to stop that. You could put Sadie Trevor and Jonathan Odom, and then you have Sadie Trevor as your pass catcher with uh, Jonathan Odom as your primary, like, inline tight end with Sadie in the slot. You do the same thing with Dante Sanders, who is going to be the starter when he's healthy. Or you can, like, Im- imagine in the red zone, Sadie Trevor, six foot four, 223 pounds, and he's proven pretty consistently that he can win jump ball catches. I think he caught 67% of his jump balls targets last year, which is kind of a lot on something that you call 50, 50 ball. So you've got the six, four, 223 pound tight end that caught 62.5% of his contested catches five for eight. And then you add in, in the red zone, Hayden Hansen, who's six foot six, 260 pounds that's a red zone threat that I don't know how you stop that if you're on defense, just size wise. Like specifically, if you're on the if you're in the red zone, I don't know what you do at that point because they can run the ball right at you and overpower you. They can just be taller than you, or they can just get really creative with their play calling and have a complete misdirection with Ricky Pierce. Like you can do so much with the grouping. That's why me, as a scheme nerd and just a nerd in general, salivating at the possibility salivating that's it uh i will say that one thing Sadu Traore really did well that florida did not have last year was a true uh a, a seam option we'll say where you can kind of line up in line and, and just work up the middle of the field and ju- just split defenses florida didn't have much of that last year Sadu Traore, he can do that <laughs> he, he does that very well just working vertically is something that he likes to do contested catches like i mentioned like you could throw it vertically with him you can go for a whole shot between the safety or with a linebacker you can throw it over the linebacker you can throw it over the safety you can just literally heave it and just let him go make the play himself there's a lot you can do with say do Traore. like you could line him up in line in the slot flex out wide i know he hasn't done that much it's fine. Like you don't put a tight end out there and go, oh yeah, no, now you have to move like a receiver too. No, you go, okay, now you're a giant target for me to throw to. If they want to put a corner on you, you're stronger. If they want to bring a linebacker or a safety all the way out there, you have to line up against them on the middle now, but now you have a better chance of stretching the field against them that way. Like you can do a lot when you have that tight end that can be dynamic and versatile. And like I mentioned before, Graham Mertz 
absolutely loved passing to tight ends last year. He that that's nothing but an absolute fact. And I mean, he's also been very open, like, yeah, like when we had Jake Ferguson, I love passing to him. That's what Graham Mertz likes to do. He likes to keep it over the middle of the field, high, high, uh, high percentage throws and work that way. You had Jack Eschenbach last year had 14 catches. Clay Cundiff had nine. You had uh, Hayden Rucci had six. You had four more tight ends that had catches on this team uh, in Wisconsin last year. It was big for them. You look at 2021 when they had more talent at tight end and Jake Ferguson led the team in targets, catches, was second in yards, first in touchdowns. Graham Mertz likes throwing to the tight end. Give him a dynamic pass catcher at tight end. That's sure-handed. Like I mentioned, one catch. You don't need a tight end, but this would help it so you can ease younger tight ends into bigger roles. So you don't have to go, hey, we're rolling out there with Arliss, Hayden, Tony, and you guys are going to play a ton of snaps right away. You can instead ease them into actual SEC play and operate out of that way and kind of just bring them along, keep Sadu Traore for a year, and then after next year, you'll or after this year, Sadu Traore is gone. Dante Sanders, I believe, is out of eligibility, so he's gone. And then you've got guys who have moderate experience and can step in and be your starters from that point on. Sounds sounds like a good plan to me, right? Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Florida Gators football. For Lockdown Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Whole Nine Sports, Giants Country, NFL 33, and I'll see you all tomorrow.